Hello friends, I welcome you back to this lecture series on aircraft performance. So in the last class we understood the range and endurance for a uh, jet engine aircraft and today we are going to discuss the takeoff performance and understand the basics of uh, accelerated flights, right? So let's begin. So whatever the analysis we have done till now, it was for zero acceleration, which means the velocity with respect to time used to remain constant. Whether it is uh, climbing analysis or glide analysis, of course, in steady level, there won't be any change in velocity, right? But now we will remove that assumption. We will take out the constant velocity or constant acceleration concept out of the picture. And let's try to understand what an accelerated flight looks like. And also we will answer the following questions. Uh, what is the runway length required and what factors reduces uh, both the takeoff and landing and what happens in an aborted takeoff, right? So we will try to answer this and few more interesting questions uh, in this particular analysis, right? So let's try to understand the takeoff performance. So assume an aircraft which is at rest at point zero and at time t naught. So it goes on to take off by traveling uh, the total takeoff distance. So as a pilot, imagine yourself as a pilot and the procedure you follow is the moment you get uh, nod from air traffic control to take off the aircraft. So immediately the first thing you will do is you release the brakes and push the throttle to its maximum power and the air aircraft starts to accelerate. Right? So let's assume at a distance of SG uh, the aircraft leaves the ground and from there at a distance of SA the aircraft clears an obstacle. That's a predefined obstacle. If that happens, we call that uh, takeoff as a successful takeoff. Clear. Now, SG is called as the ground roll and SA is called as air roll. As simple as that. Because uh, the distance covered by the aircraft when it is on ground is SG and when it is airborne, that is SA. Right? The obstacle height is fixed at around uh, 35 feet to 50 feet, depending on the type of the aircraft. If it's passenger aircraft, the obstacle height is 35 feet. And if it's a military aircraft, the obstacle that aircraft has to clear is 50 feet. Now, the total distance, that is the ground roll and the air roll. If I add both of this, I get the total takeoff distance. Now, let's do some fundamental analysis. Assume a body of mass m and I apply a constant force to that body in positive x direction. So this is the position of a body at time t is equal to 0 and at rest where velocity is 0. So because of the application of force, the body starts to move and at a distance s and at time t, its velocity reaches a value of v. Right. So at this point, I will take a snapshot and this is the image of that uh, particular system. Now, if I apply Newton's second law, which is uh, force is equal to mass into acceleration, the acceleration I can replace with the variation in velocity with respect to time or the rate of change of velocity, right? Whenever the rate comes into picture, it is with respect to time. And if I solve it for velocity, I get dv is equal to f by m into dt, where f is the net force. So it tells that to obtain a change in velocity dv, how much force I need for the given amount of mass and for how much time I need to apply that force, right? That is uh, 
the significance of this equation. Now, in order to calculate the exact values, I need to integrate it from velocity 0 to v and from time 0 to t. Right? If I apply the integral, I get the velocity as force per mass into time. And if I solve it for time, it is velocity into mass by force. Also, the velocity is defined as the rate of change of displacement, right? That is dv is equal to ds by dt. And from that ds, I can write it as v into dt. Of course, v is the uh, instantaneous velocity at any point. Now, if I substitute the value of v here, f by m into t into dt, and then again, I do the integration for the distance s, I get it as f by m into t square by 2. And from the previous equation, I'm going to substitute the value of t. So finally, I get the distance traveled by the object of mass m due to the applied force m as v square into m by 2 into f, where v is the uh, final velocity of the object, m is the mass of the object and f is the applied force. Clear? Now this equation gives the distance required for a body of mass m to accelerate to velocity v when f force is applied. Now, since we are talking about takeoff, until now the analysis was entirely when the aircraft was in air. Right? But now the aircraft is on the runway. Right? Because the takeoff starts from the beginning of the runway where the aircraft's velocity is zero. Now, before we move on to the uh, force diagram, we will try to understand why friction is so important. So all of you might have seen the F1 cars with these flat fins at the front and at the rear portion. Can you guess what may be the reason? Right? The reasons are very interesting. You see, the average speed of an F1 car is around 300 to 325, 350 sometimes kilometer per hour. With that speed and the given body, which is very streamlined to reduce the drag, the car is supposed to leave the ground without any additional fixtures. But if the car leaves the ground, the friction between the tire and the road doesn't exist. So the wheel will simply rotate without actually making the car to move. Or in mechanical terms, we call this as slip. If the wheel starts to slip, the velocity will reduce, which is not desirable for a F1 car. So what the scientists and engineers uh, came up with, they came up with a solution to generate force in the downward direction or in aerodynamic terms to generate lift in the downward direction. For that, they have fixed few fins at the front portion and few fins at the back portion so that the traction will be maintained throughout the race. Understood? This helps the car and its wheels to maintain friction between the rubber and the road surface. Now we will move on to the takeoff analysis, right? Let's consider an aircraft and whose body force diagrams are as shown. I have the thrust force in the flight path and the velocity, free stream velocity of the air opposite to that and lift and drag forces because of the free stream velocity and of course weight of the aircraft is acting downwards always. So before moving into the aerodynamics of the system, let's understand a new concept called as ground effect, right? So what happens because of the pressure difference between the upper surface and lower surface of the wings during flight, the high pressure region, high pressure air from the lower surface tries to move to upper surface at the tip. So this process, when the aircraft moves, it leaves a trail that we call it as wingtip vertices. So these wingtip vertices would actually reduce the angle of attack of the uh, aircraft. In other words, it reduces the lift itself. 
right? But what happens when the aircraft is nearer to the ground? When the aircraft is nearer to the ground, the wings are nearer to the ground itself, which will avoid the wingtip vertices. In other words, the air on the lower surface, which is at higher pressure, will give the cushioning effect to the aircraft, right? Rather than a sudden change in the forces, it gives a shock absorbing effect or cushioning effect for the aircraft, right? So this effect is called as ground effect. And at the same time, it doesn't reduce the angle of attack as such because wingtip vertices are not at all forming. Hence, there is no question in uh, the development of induced angle. Right? Induced angle is nothing but the angle of attack, the reduction in angle of attack due to the development of induced track. So the net force parallel to the ground is given by thrust, that is a net force, net thrust force minus the drag force minus I have another force as compared to the previous analysis. We have the frictional force also acting in the direction of drag, which means the friction force is trying to pull the aircraft back, right? So it is not desirable, but also at the same time, we need certain amount of frictional force. So if I expand that, I get the coefficient of friction multiplied by W minus L. So assume that the aircraft is not generating any lift, which means the aircraft is at stationary condition. So lift would be zero. So the total frictional force is nothing but the coefficient of friction multiplied by weight of the aircraft. As the aircraft accelerates, the lift starts to generate and the difference W minus L keeps on reduces and it reduces the net frictional force, right? As the net frictional force reduces, the net force keeps on increases, clear? So also with the uh, help of second, Newton's second law, I can write the net force as the mass into rate of change of velocity. dV by dt is the instantaneous acceleration of the aircraft. Now, when the aircraft is on runway, moving at certain velocity or accelerating for takeoff, the weight and thrust of the aircraft remains constant, right? With respect to the changing parameters. What are the changing parameters? Here I have the lift and drag. These two values tends to change. Why? Because they are directly proportional to the velocity component. Velocity is increasing. Definitely lift and drag should increase. Right? So, if I write the expression for both, I get lift is equal to half rho v square s into cl and the drag is half rho v square s into cd. And the coefficient of drag using the drag polar, I am going to write it as cd naught plus phi cl square upon pi e ar. So, till now, we understood the induced drag coefficient as just kcl square or cl square upon pi e ar. If you observe carefully, we get a new term here that is phi. So let's understand what this phi is. So as I said earlier, when the aircraft is nearer to the ground or when the aircraft is on the ground and the wings are nearer to the ground, there won't be any wingtip vertices. If wingtip vertices are not there, the drag, the net induced drag would be less compared to when the aircraft is airborne and there is no ground effect. Please understand this. So this ground effect is defined by a term called as phi and its value is given as 16 h by b the whole square divided by 1 plus 16 h by b the whole square where h is height of the wing above the ground and b is the wingspan, right? So quantitatively, I have found an expression to address the issue of ground effect. Now let's try to understand this graph. So we'll go step by step. First, there is a drag force and lift force. Both are increasing along with the distance 
uh, when I say distance, that means velocity, right? So here in this graph, uh, the distance represents the velocity. Velocity is increasing, hence lift and drag are also increasing. Now, if I observe carefully, there is one force which is actually decreasing. What is that? That is the frictional force. As I said, as velocity increases, lift will increase. If lift increases, the difference weight minus lift is going to decrease. If that is going to decrease, the frictional force is going to decrease with increment in velocity. Interesting, right? So, drag is increasing, frictional force is decreasing. So, the sum of drag and frictional force net is given by this dashed line and it slightly increases with increase in velocity. Understood? See, the slope is not that much that has been uh, reduced by this frictional force. Getting the point? So, this dotted line represents the net drag and frictional force which slightly increases with increase in velocity. Then I have the thrust force, which almost remains constant for a jet aircraft. Right? I have shown a small uh, reduction in thrust force, but that is due to the increment in drag. Right? So if I reduce the total thrust and if I take down the drag uh, plus the frictional force from the net thrust, I am going to get the net force acting on the aircraft, which is thrust minus the drag and frictional force. Clear. And that thrust value slightly decreases as the velocity increases owing to the increase in drag. Clear. I hope you got the point. Now, if I extrapolate this lift line <coughs> beyond this point, where the lift becomes equal to the weight of the aircraft. That is the way, that is when the aircraft uh, could able to climb in an accelerated flight. Otherwise, if only lift is equal to weight, the aircraft cannot climb. Getting the point that too during the takeoff, I want the aircraft to reach the cruising altitude as fast as possible. Right, so I want the aircraft to climb with much more acceleration. So if I want acceleration, I want the lift to be greater than weight. Understood? So if I extrapolate this lift curve uh, for to still higher point, so I get lift greater than weight. So I will end this lecture here. In the next class, we will try to understand what are the different segments in takeoff and how to derive expressions. Right, for the uh, total takeoff distance. And is there any something else we need to calculate? So we will study that in the next class. So until then, thank you very much.